Can you see the slide? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma All right. So we'll start. So with seminar two, okay. For your seminar two, a uh, obigaine part. Only, only encounter 15, 15 questions from Ubigayne. Okay, so and uh, just so to help you with your review, these only are the topics that are included in the exam. Okay, for Ubigayne, we have again, no, we have 15, you have 15 questions from Ubigayne, and this will be the topics for Ubigayne in your for your seminar two exam. Okay, so we'll just uh, try to tackle each one. And I will just emphasize the important points that you need to um, study to help you with the exam so that you will pass in the exam. Alright, so for obstetrics, Okay, so for obstetrics, we will, the topic on hypertension in pregnancy is um, uh, included. So we have here, so recall that you have, uh, basically you have five types of hypertension in pregnancy. We have five types of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. So we have chronic hypertension, preeclampsia, preeclampsia with superimposed chronic hypertension and gestational hypertension. Okay. So, what's the what's the difference between gestational hypertension and preeclampsia? The different the the similarities between the two of them is that gestational hypertension and preeclampsia are both uh, hypertensive disorders, like 140 over BP. But the difference is with preeclampsia there is proteinuria. Okay, with gestational hypertension there is no there is absence of proteinuria. Chronic hypertension is a blood pressure of 140 over 90, so prior to pregnancy, or before 20 weeks of gestation. Okay, so that's the, those are the clues there. So when the patient is already hypertensive prior to pregnancy or before 20 weeks AOG, or if the high blood or the hypertension persisted after 12 weeks after giving birth, then that's a chronic hypertension. Okay. So how about preeclampsia with superimposed, uh, superimposed hypertension? So that will be um, a woman who is already already hypertensive, but her proteinuria is um, increasing also, accelerating proteinuria, or her hypertensive hypertension or her blood pressures are also increasing, or she could have a new onset proteinuria. So those these um please take note of all the types of chronic uh, of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Okay, so the so for. So, what is the uh, ultimate cure for preeclampsia? It's termination of pregnancy. Meaning, uh, when you the only cure for preeclampsia is when you deliver the baby. Okay, that's the only cure. However, of course, you cannot do that always for preeclampsia. Okay, so what you do is this one. Okay, so you can give magnesium sulfate and antihypertensive agents. Okay, magnesium sulfate is not an antihypertensive agent. Okay. Magnesium sulfate is mainly to prevent seizures or to prevent eclampsia. Okay, so um, antihypertensive agents are the following. You can give hydralazine, labetanol, and nifedipine. So don't forget, magnesium sulfate is not an antihypertensive agent. It is a given for preeclamptic patients to prevent eclampsia. Okay, the second topic is preterm labor. Okay, when you see preterm labor, this is labor that commences at less than 37 weeks. Okay, so we also have what we call PTROM or preterm premature rupture of membranes. Uh, this is the rupture of membrane or the bag of waters less than 37 weeks prior to the onset of labor. Okay, so how do you treat preterm labor? Of course, don't forget to give corticosteroids. Okay. You give corticosteroids from 24 to 34 weeks AOG, and these are the two corticosteroids that you give. You can give dexamethasone or betamethasone. These are the doses. Don't forget, what is corticosteroids for? Corticosteroids is given for, not as a tocolytic, but it is for what? For lung maturation. 
A, you give corticosteroids for lung maturation, especially if you expect that the baby will deliver. Okay? So, tocolytics, what does tocolytic mean? Tocolytic is uh, a drug that you can give to stop the contractions. Okay? So, what are the tocolytics? Beta-adrenergic agonist, calcium channel blockers, prostaglandin inhibitors. You can also give magnesium sulfate, no? As if you recall, magnesium sulfate is a drug that we give preeclampsia patients. However, it can also be used as a tocolytic. It can also be used as a drug to, to prevent preterm labor or to stop preterm labor. It can also give atosibad and nitric oxide to the donors. Okay, so the third topic is obstetrical hemorrhage. Okay, there are uh, several types of obstetrical hemorrhage. Okay, the first is uterine atony. And this is the failure of the uterus to contract sufficiently after the delivery of the baby. Okay, so for example, you have already delivered the baby and the uterus failed to contract. Okay, so that is what you call uterine atony. It, it, it is one of the most common um, causes of obstetrical hemorrhage in, um, that, that is causing death okay, worldwide. Okay, how do you treat uterine atony? You can give uterotonic agents. And what are these uterotonic agents? These are oxytocin, methyl ergonavin, arbuprost, and dinoprostone. So these are the uterotonic agents that you can give. Okay, the next is uterine inversion. Okay. So uterine inversion is when it happens when the uterus when, when you're trying to deliver the placenta and the uterus um, inverted while you deliver the placenta. Usually this happens when you hold on the placenta too vigorously, okay? So, that will cause obstetrical hemorrhage. The treatment for that is you relax the placenta by general anesthesia or any uterine relaxant and then you try to replace the uterus inside the body or the vagina or the, the pelvis of the mom or you can do surgery also, okay? Other causes of obstetrical hemorrhage are injuries to the birth canal, okay? Like hematoma and something like that, okay? And uterine rupture. Uterine rupture usually uh, occurs especially for women who has a prior uh, history of cesarean section or myomectomy. Okay? That, can, that can happen. Okay? So this can also happen when you do fundal push for a patient in labor. So okay, for uterine rupture, you have, to, you have to deliver the baby ASAP by abdominal delivery and then you have to you can do hysterectomy if the rupture is really severe or if the rupture is not that bad, you can do primary repair of the uterine rupture. Okay, another type of obstetrical hemorrhage is abruptio placenta. Okay, what is abruptio placenta from the word itself? Abrupt. Okay, it means that this is the separation of the placenta from its implantation site before the delivery of the baby. Okay, so again, Abruptio placenta is a separation of the placenta from the implantation site before the delivery of the baby. Okay? So, usually, these patients um, present with tetanic contractions. Okay? So, when you, when you monitor the patient and you, um, what do you call this, when you detect tetanic contractions, then that, will, that is indicative of abruptio placenta. And the treatment for abruptio placenta is, of course, emergency cesarean delivery of the baby. Okay. Another type of surgical hemorrhage is a placenta previa. What does placenta previa mean? It means that, oh no, for the, from the word itself, previa. Okay. From the word itself, it means that the placenta um, is implanted before the fetus in the birth canal. What it means that um, the placenta is uh, implanted or is... Um, in the way of the birth canal, okay, it is it is very close the cervical opening, okay. So we have four kinds: the total, partial, low lying, and the marginal previa. So just take note of all these types of placenta previa, okay. Placenta cita, on the other hand, is when the placenta is abnormally implanted or abnormally adherent to the myometrium. So take a look. And this happens because of the absence of Decido basalis and the imperfect development of the nita book layer. Okay, we have three kinds of placenta acrita. That's uh, placenta acrita, increta, and percreta. So if you look at this uh, picture here, acreta is 
when the placenta in, is attached only in the surface of the myometrium. In Creta, is when the placenta invades the muscle or the myometrium. Per Creta is when it already um, pushes outside of the serosa or the outermost layer of the myometrium. So that's the three types of placenta acrita. What's the treatment for placenta acrita? Okay, the, plus, the treatment for that, of course, is you have to do cesarean section for the baby, and after that, uh, you do hysterectomy if it's a uh, increta or percreta. Okay, so the fourth um, obstetrical topic will be clinical pelvimetry. Okay, so just to just so to help you with the very shortcut way of studying clinical pelvimetry. Just please memorize this box, this table here. So recall now that you have three planes, the inlet, the mid plane, and the outlet. Okay. Usually in obstetrics, you will be asked if, for example, you will be given um, a question and then you will answer if it's an inlet, mid plane, or outlet level. Okay, so... Aside from that, you may be asked if the findings that was given to you is adequate or inadequate. Okay? So, for example, for example, your, your, your question involved the diagonal conjugate. Okay? If, if you are if you're given a question uh, on diagonal conjugate, then, uh, for example, diagonal conjugate greater than 11.5, then diagonal conjugate is at the level of the pelvic inlet. Or, Another way of saying that is sacral promontory cannot be reached. Okay, so if you're given this uh, findings, then that's the pelvic inlet. The answer for that is the pelvic inlet. And um, that's adequate. It's more than 11.5 or the sacral promontory cannot reach. It is inadequate when it's the, the opposite of this. So diagonal conjugate less than 11.5 or the sacral promontory is reached. Okay. Okay, another plane is the mid plane. So we have these are the findings for the mid plane. The sacrum is curved, sacrosciatic notch is wide, ischial spines are not prominent, interischial diameter greater than 8.5, and the side walls are divergent. So again, uh, so these are the, the findings that can be asked of you in the exam, and then you will you will say if it's the inlet, mid plane, or outlet. Now it's Adequate, the mid plane will be adequate if you find this, uh, if these are the findings in the clinical pelvimetry. It is inadequate if you find this um, written. No? Okay. So if instead of having a curved sacrum, you have a curve or a straight sacrum or a shallow sacrum. If the sacrosciatic notch is narrow, if the ischial spines are uh, prominent, if the interischial diameter is less than 8.5, or the sidewalls are convergent. Okay. And lastly, outlet. Okay, so if the interischial diameter is in the mid plane level, for the outlet, we have the intertuberous diameter. Okay, so don't forget that. Okay, so when you're asked the interischial diameter, you answer mid plane. However, if you are being asked the intertuberous diameter, that's the outlet. Okay. So, an adequate outlet would mean that the intertuberous diameter is greater than 8 centimeters, subcubic angle is greater than 90, or another way of saying that is wide subcubic angle and um, movable coccyx. Okay? An inadequate outlet will be an intertuberous diameter less than 8, subcubic angle less than 90, or a narrow subcubic angle, and the coccyx is not movable or not easily depressed. Okay? So, please memorize this. Okay. For sure, this will be asked of you in the exam. Okay, so you can be asked the diagonal conjugate, the ischial spines, or the tuberous diameter. Okay, so then you will say whether whether what plane it is. Okay, or if it's adequate or inadequate. Just memorize this table and you'll be fine. All right. So those are the topics for obstetrics. Okay, so just those four. Now for gynecology. Okay, so. So this is the polycystic ovary syndrome. Okay, so so for the sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so 
So for the polycystic ovary syndrome, please memorize the criteria. Okay, what is the criteria for polycystic ovary syndrome? It's uh, menstrual irregularity, hyperandrogenism, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. Just three. Okay, and that is what we call the Rotterdam criteria. Okay, and then please memorize also the pathophysiology. Memorize also the pathophysiology of PCOS. Okay, what is the central pathophysiology? The central pathophysiology is insulin resistance. Don't forget that. It's not obesity, it's not hyperandrogenism, but the central pathophysiology is insulin resistance. Okay? Then with, with insulin resistance comes hyperinsulinemia and the excess insulin in the blood is actually the one um, coaxing the, the theca cells of the ovary to hyperproduce androgen. And then the excess androgen that is being produced by the ovary uh, leads to hyperandrogenic um, symptoms and signs in the patient, like, for example, acne, seborrhea, hirsutism, uh, alopecia, all of those. Okay? All right. The next uh, gynecological topic is pelvic endometriosis. Okay, so endometriosis is the presence and the growth of the glands and stroma of the lining of the uterus in an aberrant or heterotopic uh, location. Now, the classic symptoms of endometriosis are cyclic pelvic pain and infertility. So, don't forget that. The classic symptoms. So, if the patient comes to you complaining of um, cyclic pelvic pain, then you highly suspect pelvic endometriosis. What does cyclic mean? Cyclic means that it... Um, there's pelvic pain every time the patient has menses. So this is the symptom. So what's the classic uh, uh, sign or pelvic finding? It is a fixed retroverted uterus. So don't forget that. The fixed retroverted uterus is the classic pelvic finding of a patient with endometriosis. And you can also um, palpate for a nodular uterosacral ligament and a cul-de-sac. That's also nodular. Okay, these are the theories. Please um, uh, study the theories on, on uh, pelvic endometriosis. Okay, retrograde menstruation, another term for this is what? The, Sam, the Samson's um, theory of a retrograde menstruation. So, this uh, theory explains the uh, retrograde uh, journey of the blood, of the menstrual blood. So, instead of coming, all of it coming out of the vagina, it, are retro, it flows retrogradely into the fallopian tubes and out of the fallopian tubes and then implants in the ovaries and in other parts of the pelvis. And sometimes not only the pelvis but also the colon. Okay? So that's what retrograde menstruation means. For celomic metaplasia, this is the theory that explains the presence of endometriosis in patients who are not menstruating. Okay? Who are those? Patients who are born without a uterus, patients who are adolescents, right? If they're adolescents, they're not yet menstruating. And yet, there are some findings of endometriosis in their, in their pelvic region. Also, there are the men. The men are not the male, the male patients. They are not, of course, they're not menstruating. They don't have uterus. And yet, uh, there are some findings, rare findings of endometriosis in, in men. And that is explained by salomic metaplasia. Okay. So for lymphatic and vascular metastasis, uh, this uh, theory explains the, uh, the findings of endometriotic implants in, in other uh, remote, in other remote um, organs such as the lungs, what else, um, the colon, the nose, the lymphatics. So, so that is kind of like um, the what we call this, um, uh, the spread, you know, how that this theory explains how the endometriosis is spread in all other organs or what we call the metastasis. Okay? So, iatrogenic dissemination by the term itself, iatrogenic means that it is because of the doctor. You know? so, Meaning, if the doctor, for example, um, did operation on a, on a patient with um, endometriosis, that doctor might, um, you know, unwittingly uh, disseminate the endometriotic implants. Where will it disseminate? In the skin or 
or probably in the vagina when he did or she when he or she did the episiotomy or episiotomy. Okay. Immunologic changes. This theory explains the um, immunologic basis of um, uh, of endometriosis, most particularly on the on the problematic uh, natural killer cells among patients with endometriosis. Okay? And genetic predisposition is the theory that um, explains why endometriosis runs in the family. For example, if you if you have endometriosis, most likely your mother had endometriosis or your sisters also have endometriosis. Okay. All right, so the treatment for endometriosis, the primary short-term goals will be the relief of pain. Of course, this is, this I've, I've already told you, endometriosis causes pelvic pain, right? And also the promotion of fertility. And the long-term goal is uh, prevention of uh, progression or recurrence of the disease. So the treatment can be medical, surgical, or combination of medical and surgical treatment. For surgery, we have two kinds. So we can do conservative or definitive surgery. When you say definitive, it means that you will take out the ovaries, take out the uterus. Okay? When you say conservative, you don't take out the, the ovaries, you don't take out the uterus. You will just do some additional lysis, you will just destroy the endometriotic implants, or you just will uh, restore the norm normal pelvic anatomy. You're not taking out anything. Um, as opposed to doing a definitive surgery where you remove the ovaries, you remove the uterus. Okay, you can also do medical. Okay? And for medical therapy, usually what we give are uh, GnRH agonists. Okay? Sometimes we give danazole and other progesterones. Okay? However, because of the androgen, highly androgenic effects of danazole, we don't give this anymore. Usually, we just give GnRH agonists or progestins or progesterone. Okay, the third topic is infertility. And what is the formal definition of infertility? This is the inability of a couple to conceive after one year of trying. Okay, meaning after one year of regular coitus, they haven't um, conceived yet, then that's infertility. However, sorry about this, it's not after one week. So after one year will become after six months. Sorry, this is uh, wrong. <laughs> Sorry. So it will be after six months if the patient, if the female patient is already 35 years old and above. If the patient is uh, has a ligor amenorrhea, has a known tubal obstruction, she has a uterine disease or endometriosis, or if the male has a known male factor, for example, the male uh, is already diagnosed to so have poor sperm count. Again, I'm sorry. This is a this is a um, error in my part. That's not after one week. After six months. Okay. So usually, the, the formal definition of infertility is um, one year, right? One after one year trying. However, if the patient has all of these or at least one of these, then you can you can just uh, you can do work up on infertility after six months instead of waiting for one year. Okay, these are the causes of infertility. The most common is an ovulation. And what is that an ovulatory condition that you know that is the most common? PCOS. No? PCOS is the most common an uh, ovulatory disorder uh, that's seen among women. Okay. Okay, so one of the one of the things that you should document in infertility patients is uh, documentation of ovulation. Okay, you have to prove is the patient ovulating or not. Okay, so one of and these are the things that you will have to elicit. Okay, so as to document ovulation. Okay, so if the patient is having regular monthly cycles, then most likely, uh, most likely, uh, she is ovulating. Okay, now with LH kit. So with LH kit, this is a. Uh, but this is very similar to the pregnancy kit. However, LH kit um, detects ovulation, not pregnancy. Okay, so 
Now, if the LH kit showed a positive um, positive sign when you did the LH kit, what does that mean? What, when is the best time to have intercourse if the LH kit tested positive? The best time to have intercourse will be on the day that the LH kit turned positive and the following day. Okay? So, don't forget that, please. Uh, that will be asked in the exam. Again, when you're using LH kit, the, and then the LH kit tested positive today, let's say today. So the best time to have uh, intercourse if you want to get pregnant is today and the following day. Okay, so don't forget that. Okay, you can also do a mid luteal serum progesterone. And if the serum progesterone is greater than 10, then uh, that means that the patient ovulated, okay, and she's uh, fertile for that cycle. What does mid luteal mean? Mid luteal mean that, uh, means that uh, uh, that's day 21 of the patient cycle. Okay, for a patient who's, who has a normal 28-day cycle, then mid luteal would mean um, day 21. Okay, for the basal body temperature, again, this is, uh, you would have to ask or request for the patient to take her body temperature right after uh, right after she wakes up in the morning you no know, before doing anything before um, brushing her teeth before eating once she gets up from bed she will take the temperature using a thermometer and then plot it okay plot it every day for the next three to six months and then she will look at the uh, she will look at the pattern of her temperature. A bi-basal uh, uh, bi -basal body temperature uh, will be a sign that she is ovulatory. Okay? Endometrial biopsy. Usually, endometrial biopsy is done on the second half of the cycle, presumably the secretory. Now, if the biopsy showed uh, a secretory phase endometrium, then that is um, indicative of uh, indicative of uh, ovulation. If the biopsy that you did on the second half of the cycle showed that it's proliferative, then that is um, indicative that the patient did not ovulate for that um, for that cycle. Okay, okay. So another way of documenting ovulation is by ultrasound. Okay, you do follicle monitoring. So you look at the look at um, ultrasound uh, evidence of of uh, a mature follicle and follow that up and then look for signs of corpus luteum. Now, if you see that on ultrasound, then you're quite sure that the patient is ovulatory. And of course, the preg pregnancy, of course, or a history of pregnancy is the best evidence of ovulation. All right, so the fourth um, topic, please memorize this, okay? I have, there's no other way to, to perfect your, to have a perfect score in for ob but you know, you have to memorize this. So you have uh, five stages, stage, uh, stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. So stage zero will be no prolapse, okay? Stage one, is uh, when the most distal portion of the prolapse is more than 1 cm from the hymen. Stage 2 pelvic organ prolapse is when the most distal portion of the prolapse is less or equal to 1 cm proximal or distal to the, to the hymen. Stage 3 is more than 1 cm. So if stage 1 is greater than 1 cm above the level of the hymen, stage 3 is greater than 1 cm below the level of the hymen. Okay, so that's the difference stage between stage one and stage three. Okay, stage three is greater than one cm below the hymen. Stage two is uh, within one cm from the hymen. Okay, so please remember those uh, semantics. And stage four is when the top, when the whole length of the vagina, uh, sorry, when the whole length of the uterus is already completely averted. Okay, there's complete aversion of the total length of the lower genital tract. Usually, the, the pelvic organ that usually prolapses or completely averts is the uterus, okay? So when you see the whole uterus out of the vagina, automatically it's stage four. Okay, so the fifth topic is high-dotidiform mole, 
Okay, so um, usually the hydrotidy form mole presents as uh, bleeding in the first trimester. Okay, with or without the passage of molar vesicles. And other classic signs of hydrotidiform wall include large for date uterus. What does, what does this mean, large for date uterus? It means that, for example, uh, when you computed for the AOG of the patient, um, you just computed, let's say, eight, eight weeks. However, when you did physical exam, uh, the uterus is enlarged to 16 weeks. Okay, so that is typical of uh, hydrotidiform wall. It's larger larger than the AOG. The, the uterus is larger than your computed AOG. So another is when um, there's no fet fetus, of course. Uh, there's anemia, secondary to occult hemorrhage. She's uh, hypertensive. There's a fecalotane cyst or she has hyperemesis, hyperthyroidism, and respiratory distress. So those are the other classic signs of hydrotidiformol. Okay, so there are two kinds of hydrotidiformol. There's the complete or complete hydatidiform mole, and the PHM means partial hydatidiform mole. Usually, the difference between the two is the what? The, this one. Partial hydatidiform mole usually has um, fetal or embryonic tissues, whereas complete hydatidiform mole uh, does not have fetal or embryonic tissues. Okay? Please don't forget that. And, um, I'm sorry. So, uh, PHM usually has a generally uh, a smaller volume of hydropic villi compared to the complete hydrotidiform mole. Okay, so what's the classic treatment or prophylactic um, chemotherapy for hydrotidiform mole? You remember? It's methotrexate. Okay, so before that, how do you diagnose hydrotidiform mole? The classic way of diagnosing hydrotidiform mole is through transvaginal ultrasound and you look for the snowstorm pattern okay so you how do you treat you can do either suction curettage or hysterectomy you only do hysterectomy again for patients who have completed family size if the patient has not yet completed her family size then you don't have any choice you can do suction curettage no not and not hysterectomy methotrexate is given for patients as a form of prophylactic chemotherapy okay so please don't forget methotrexate that's the uh, chemotherapy of choice that's given for each mole patients prophylactically okay sixth topic is um pid Okay, and the, the hallmark of PID is pelvic pain. And this is the infection of the upper genital tract. The most commonly involved uh, organ for PID is what? It is the fallopian tubes. Okay? And sorry, you have to memorize this. No? At least memorize the minimum criteria. I don't expect you to memorize this other criteria, but please memorize the minimum criteria. Minimum criteria is lower abdominal tenderness, adnexal tenderness, and cervical motion tenderness. Okay, just those three. You need to you need just one out of the three. What's fits you curtis syndrome? This is a syndrome that you see in PID patients where you see this one, you look at the picture, you see violin string adhesions in the liver between the liver and the anterior peritoneum. So that's what they call fitz u curtis syndrome. Again, no, these are violin string adhesions between the parietal peritoneum and the liver. And this is the outpatient treatment for PID. You can give cefriaxone plus doxycycline with or without metronidazole. The inpatient um, management for PID is you have regimen A and regimen B. For regimen A, you can give cefotetan with the doxycycline or cefoxetine with the doxycycline. Or for regimen B, clindamycin plus gentamicin. Okay? So, you don't really have to memorize the dose. Just familiarize yourself with regimen A and regimen B. Okay? For lower genital tract infections, okay, so remember this is the Bartholin cyst. The Bartholin's, Bartholin's gland cyst is a uh, cyst of the Bartholin's gland. And just, okay, so usually the Bartholin's glands are located in the 6 o'clock or in 5 o'clock position. Okay, so absence of the Bartholin's gland use, uh, usually causes acute pain and tenderness. Okay, and 
Other signs will include erythema, acute tenderness, edema, and cellulitis. Okay, and the treatment for this will be marsupialization. So you have to open this cyst and um, to let the to let out the, the abscess inside. Okay, and let it heal by secondary invention. So that's Bartholin's lens. Next is you have the molluscum contagiosum. Okay, the molluscum contagiosum, as you can see in this picture, uh, this is very typical. No, you have a papule with an umbilicated center. So if you see this um, keywords in your exam, papule with an umbilicated center, then um, automatic your answer is molluscum contagiosum. Okay, this is our flesh-colored papules, dome-shaped papules that you see in the vulvar area. Okay, so this is caused by a virus and therefore um, there's really no treatment. You, you don't really have to give antibiotics for patients with molluscum contagiosum. You just, uh, because this is self-limiting infection, no? typical of any viral disease. Now, for genital ulcers, we typically have these uh, five most common types of uh, genital ulcers. That's syphilis, herpes, chancroid, uh, lymph granuloma venereum, and donovanosis. Now, for the purpose of studying for Seminar 2, because, uh, you know, you just need a quick review for, uh, for genital ulcers, I suggest that, you know, you don't really have to go through your old notes on genital ulcers or even uh, going back to the book. No, uh, that on uh, that lengthy chapter on genital ulcers. Um, just a tip: you can just uh, familiarize yourself with the important details of these genital ulcers just by looking at this table. Okay, just so that's a tip for you on how to um, prepare yourselves for the, the seminar to obigaine. Okay, so just to emphasize, uh, genital ulcers for syphilis and herpes usually they look the same. It's just that uh, the main difference will lie on the, well, aside from the etiology, of course, the difference will lie on the pain that the patient feels, okay? Usually, uh, genital ulcers for syphilis are painless, whereas genital ulcers for herpes are very, very painful, okay? And also, uh, among these five, herpes will be the uh, most common genital ulcer, okay? So, most likely, when a, when a patient comes to you, complaining of uh, painful uh, genital ulcers, then uh, probably more than 50% of the time, the diagnosis will be herpes, okay? Because that's the most common. All right, so I, I will leave this to you, no? So this will be your assignment. Familiarize yourselves with the very important details, okay? I don't expect you to memorize all these details. Just, you know, pick out the, the important details in this table, okay? And lastly, for pediagyne, okay, that I suggest that you memorize this um, table on standard staging. Remember that for uh, girls, we have uh, two components for standard staging. We have the breast growth and the pubic hair growth, okay? So B1 stands for uh, prepubertal or the elevation of papilla only. B2 is breast budding. B3, enlargement of breast with glandular tissue without separation of breast contours. B4 is secondary mound formed by the areola. And B5, single contour of breast and areola. Now, for pubic hair, we have pH1, no pubic hair. pH2, labial hair present. pH3, labial hair spreads over the mons pubis. pH4, slight lateral spread. And pH5, uh, further lateral spread to form that inverse triangle. Now, the first sign of puberty is usually the appearance of breast budding, followed within a few months by the appearance of pubic hair. So, remember, this is the sequence of pubertal development. So, we have breast budding, pubic hair, growth spurt, and menarche. Okay, so, as you can see in the sequence, the earliest sign of puberty will be breast budding, and the last will be menarche. Okay, and the interval between breast budding and menarche is 2.3 years plus or minus 1 year. Okay, so that will be all for this uh, review session for your seminar 2. Uh, thank you for attending this review session. Good luck!